and welcome to Festival Speaks. Today is Wednesday, January 16th, and this is episode 237. I'm Amy Beth, also known as the Fat Squirrel on Ravelry, also known as the lady with the dirtiest, scummiest glasses in the world, also known as the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. That's the Fat Squirrel, but the squirrel has no vowels. Because somebody else is the Fat Squirrel. Hi, how are you? I apologize if I'm a little bit distracted. I've tried to really ground myself. Another reason we're in this room today rather than the yarn room. This is the kitchen. It's a little closer to the hearth. It's a little bit more of a grounded space for me. But it is right next to the window that is on the bird feeders. And let's just discuss <laughs> that living in the city, I asked for bird feeders for my birth, for Christmas, not for my birthday. I asked for bird feeders from my family for Christmas and they came through, right? Like they gave us beautiful bird feeders and we went through the typical thing where you put them out for a few weeks. I've always wanted bird feeders. In fact, when I was living in an apartment, Years and years ago, I had a bird feeder, and then the downstairs neighbor complained because the seed was falling onto her porch. But I haven't had one here, even though I actually have a backyard, because we've had that giant tree in it. It just was like, I don't know, it just never felt like it was dumb. I should have just gotten them. But whatever, I'm starting to integrate that outdoor space more into my life. And part of the integration is having bird feeders out there. And so we've got the bird feeders out there and I've been like so excited. Everybody in the house is like checking in to see what's going on with the bird feeders. And my husband's getting a phone call. And let's just discuss. <laughs> we have, are you ready for it? A couple, like a, a male and a female cardinal we did have three morning doves the other day and 900 house sparrows <laughs> since Christmas. Like we put them up like three days after Christmas maybe. Nine million sparrows. I am wrong. I miscounted. Nine million sparrows. But I gotta be honest with you, even though they are eating us out of house and home, and I know that there are lots of issues with house sparrows and that they crowd out. They're non-indigenous. They crowd out um, other birds. Hmm. And they do, They my issue is that they do seem to block other birds. Now, again, granted, it's winter. We're in the city. There aren't a lot of people that have feeders around here. I don't even know, like, what the population that has access to our yard looks like. Um... But it does seem like that they have, that their mob mentality kind of is off-putting to other birds. Because, um, like, I noticed the the cardinals are very furtive. Like, when they come to eat, they are just, like, like, they are constantly on guard and they maybe eat one seed. Whereas the sparrows, because there's 900 of them and they can, like, trust George and Sam to do lookout, are just in there like, I <laughs> Really, like our bird feeder is like a, like a little hexagon. It's not little, it's actually quite big. Let me just discuss, there was lots of heartache trying to find a bird pole for it. Anyway. <laughs> but it's like quite, it's like a 18 inch diameter. So it's quite, and then so then there's like a tube in the middle where the seed and then it just kind of comes out along the bottom of this hexagonal feeder. Um, and so it's like a little gazebo for the birds. So the sparrows, I mean, no, they will be just like uh -huh, and elbows in there, like just packed in there, just like, gah, 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 gah. and the cardinal will literally just be sitting on the fence post like, every great one fell. Like when we had a bunch of snow the other day, we got like seven inches of snow. For some reason on that day, the cardinals and then the morning doves, which we have not seen since, felt emboldened enough to try to get in there and like muscle in. 
but since they've been like, no, thank you. So we're trying to decide if we need to get like, we actually have like, we have like a fancy, like finch feeder, oh, that's not fancy, but you know, we have like a finch feeder and then like a peanut feeder. Um, but maybe we need to just get like another 75 general purpose feeders. <laughs> and like a second mortgage for bird seed. And then maybe we'll be able to get everybody in. I'm secretly like, maybe my garden will do really well. Although again, I'm gonna have to put like, I'm gonna have to put like, hoop frames over everything until it's like six feet tall because these birds are gonna decimate it. Ugh. May have done something terrible. Whatever, it's a learning experience. I have found them enjoyable. Hmm. Okay, so <laughs> I was actually planning to do like a gigantic episode today, um, and gigantic for me anyway. Um, but I think what I'm actually gonna do is um, actually split the episode into two pieces. I'm gonna do. Um, like a regular episode and then normally I would do like a book review like in the shenanigans or like the non-knitting part of the podcast but this one is a little bit different in that it's a little different and I'll talk about when I talk about it so just so you know you're gonna see this episode and then I'm gonna try to record this thing today so that I can just get it done and so you'll see that one shortly thereafter. If you are on iTunes, I don't always upload bonus episodes to iTunes uh, because they do tend to have a very, they don't tend to have, the pe the, pers the uh, company I use to like store and house my iTunes videos has a very limited data file size. Um, so I don't always upload those there. If you want to be made aware of whenever there are notifications, um, or whenever there are bonus episodes, you can either subscribe to the YouTube channel and just get the updates and then just not watch it on YouTube if that's not your jam. Or if you're not interested in that at all, you can go to my blog, which is just thefatscroll.com. And there's, I think it's either on the right or maybe it's at the bottom if you're on a mobile device. There is a place where you can put your email. I will not have access to your email. Like I won't send you like shop information or anything like that, it'll just ping you when I put a new episode up because I usually put them on the blog so there's show notes and things like that for folks. So if, you, if you're if you not sure you're getting those and you are exclusively at iTunes or Downcast or you know what I mean, like any feed that's fueled by iTunes, um, that is a way you can get information about um, uploads that are happening that maybe I'm not uploading to iTunes. That feels like a, a good amount of administrative information. Right? right? Okay, so let's talk about shenanigans. Shenanigans! So there's not a ton of knitting. I mean, there's not, it's not like I didn't knit. Like I actually would knit quite a bit, but there's not a lot of knitting. I didn't knit on a lot of things this week at all um, because it's been a busy few weeks. We had a great snowfall. We have not had a good snowfall yet this year. We had a little bit of ice earlier in the year, but we finally got like a seven inch snowfall. So we were shoveling and then we were sled riding. I know somebody on, I can't remember, I think it was on my Instagram account. Somebody was like, I didn't know you had hills in Indiana. There are very few. <laughs> now Southern Indiana is nice. Like, I don't know that I would quite say foothillsy but it's nice it has a nice texture to it um but like north of about 20 minutes south of indianapolis it's just like glacier sweep like you can just feel the grit as it fully retracted <laughs> but that said we do have a very few hills in, in indianapolis and luckily one of them is like across the street from me um, so we are able to actually walk to our neighborhood park that has a, a pretty decent sledding hill. It's not great. Uh, it is great. What am I saying? It's great. It's a hill. It's big enough. You can ride a sled down it. It's great. Um, so, <laughs> although people could be less garbagey, I'm just going to have a moment. I usually try to look on the bright side, but just for one second. 
totally buy those cruddy sleds. And I understand sleds are not an investment that everybody has access to. We've had our sleds for like, my husband still has his radio flyer from like his ute. And we have an old Rubbermaid sled that is like 20 years old. So I mean, I understand like not everybody has a place to store that kind of stuff year to year. Not everybody has access to the capital to invest in that year to year. I wish we had some sort of like, oh, that would be so awesome. Like a library, like a sled library. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic. So there's a lot of me to say. I understand why people buy, also there's access. Like I don't even know where to buy a good sled anymore. Like L.L. Bean? $9,000 later. Like, so like, I'm not, uh, what I'm saying is problematic and I understand that. Um, but if you are gonna buy a $1 sled, dude, pick it up when it inevitably breaks on the hill. Like we talk, <laughs> uh, my part, my husband and my daughter went over the first day that it was as it was snowing and they actually came home. They like just, I think we did one run and they were like, dude, there's too many people over there. Apparently it was a little bit crazy and like lots of like unmonitored small humans. So we all went back on the Sunday morning, like after the snow had finished pretty much. Um, and it was like, a war. I mean, that's. Sorry, that's a gross hyperbole. But it was crazy. There was like plastic everywhere. It was like kid kegger had happened or something. Oh my God. So I did a little bit of like huffy fat lady walking to pick up plastic. <laughs> it was very huffy. We only took back what we could carry. We left a bunch because like I couldn't even carry it all. And I was self-righteous, but not that self-righteous. <laughs> I wanted somebody else to have the opportunity to be in a huff, because, you know, sometimes it's enjoyable and cathartic. <laughs> so I let her have that right. Oh my gosh, but it was really fun. And, um, and like, there's always this, like, weird, I, so I apologize on Instagram that I actually don't have any pictures of me. I, I do occasionally ride this sled. I, I do ride it every year, but I don't do like multiple trips because quite frankly, the <laughs> bank to like climb up to the top of the hill is a little bit treacherous and we don't have health insurance right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have to stay at the bottom and send all my praying energy to protect my other people going up the hill. But I do go up the hill and slide down and sled down. But I apologize, I don't have any pictures of me because I'm usually the one trying to take pictures of everything. And so, like, when it's my turn, my main focus, like, before I actually get on the sled is just, like, where, like, how to put the, the camera in my bra or whatever so that it doesn't get banged up on the trip down. Because <laughs> you have to use, like, the good camera with, like, the hoobly doo lens to try to get stuff to happen. Um... <laughs> So I do apologize. I really want to try to get some like unapologetically, unapologetically unflattering pictures of my fat butt slide, sledding down the hill. And I will really, I'm going to try to try to make that happen for y'all because hashtag fat chick sledding does not have any members right now. And I would like to be the first, but please you be the first if you have a picture because So we did that. What else did we do? Oh, I get to play Charterstone. Um, friends, Bill and Joanna of Knitspin Farm, um, asked if I would asked if I would play Charterstone with them and some other folks. How exciting is that? So if you don't know anything about it, Charterstone, Charterstone is a legacy board game. So, and if you don't know anything about what that is, that's kind of like a newer family of board games that often reveal themselves over a set number of encounters with said board games. So for example, in Charterstone, it's over 12 games that the game actually reveals its full content and you play through it. So there's like, usually there's an evolving storyline in addition to evolving rule sets. 
um, evolving challenges and things like that. And so in theory, some of these games are consumable, meaning that they, you will only play through them um, one, like you'll only play through the entirety of them once. Uh, but many of them, Charterstone is an example of that, sell like refresh packs so that you can, um, in fact, Charterstone has a double-sided board. So another um, factor in these consume these legacy style games is that you often are making permanent changes to the game. So s sometimes you're changing the board itself by adding stickers or um, changing values of certain things or adding more places for things to go or um, you're often changing cards. Like some of them will have you destroy cards. Some of them are just cards that will go in and out of play over the course of the game. Um, but, 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 an aspect of that is, is that lots of times that means it's a consumable game, meaning either, uh, for example, in like Pandemic Legacy, you play through the game. Now, once you're done, you have your own, you can replay the game. Again, it's, it, you can replay the final game, like you can use it as a board game after you complete the Legacy portion, but you can't like start at point A and work through the whole Legacy uh, again, from what I understand. I just outed myself as having not completed the pandemic legacy, which we haven't. Um, but some of them, you can buy refresher packs. Charter Stern is one of those where you can actually flip, in this case, you flip the board over. The board's the same on both sides. And you can essentially go through the whole process again. And it will inevitably be different because people play out in different sequences and you may have fewer or more players than you had the first time. What have you. So I believe this one is from... Two I don't know, it's up to six players. But I don't know what the minimum player count is. I don't know if it's two or three or four. Anyway, it's up to six players and it's a worker placement game. Um, so you're like, you have little dudes who do stuff for you depending on where you put them. Um, it's also like um, an economic like engine building game. So like you are creating more spaces to do stuff um, as the game progresses. And then I'm sure other elements of itself will be revealed that I don't know about because no spoilers. But it's very enjoyable. So we played our first game of that last of that last weekend, which was so fun. It was also very fun to be there on a Friday night, like our true awesomely fancy pants socialite selves. Friday night, playing a board game. Half of us knitting socks. We know how to live. So anyway, so that was super fun, and I'm excited to continue that. That's so fancy. But so anyway, so if you're a board gaming family, um, you know, there are, that has had so many positive reviews. Again, I can't offer my own um, review on it. The first game was fun. Um, it was very approachable. It was a very small rule set um, to start off with, so I'm assuming it would be great for lots of different um, abilities for families and what have you um, but you can certainly f um, find more information about that there are tons of reviews out on it that are actually real people doing reviews like real board game people but that was fun. I already talked about watching our bird leaders our bird feeders okay and then what else oh so what have I been listening okay so then there's like shenanigans of the pocketbook. I don't usually talk about these things because I'm kind of <sighs> about fashion. And this is not fashion, like fashion, fashion. I'm kind of <sighs> about clothing. <laughs> but I do have to tell you that Sweet Legs, which is that Canadian legging company, have started to make fat, fat lady leggings. So they're like 18 to 26 or 18 to 28. They're in um, a limited number of styles, but I'm pretty sure they're rolling out more as time goes on. And so I have purchased those leggings for my daughter and they have held up better than any other leggings, like non-athletic leggings. So leggings that aren't, um, compression leggings or again specifically made for athletics but they've held up better than any of the like other like snugly soft leggings 
um, that I purchased first. So I'm hoping that the fat lady ones do the same. I totally have some. Do you want to see them? Oh my gosh. Can I put my really super fat legs up here for you? Let's try. Okay, so people who are anti-foot, you're about to have a foot warning. I have a bare foot that is slightly covered, but is nonetheless bare, that's about to be on the screen. So just just fast forward, or close your eyes, and I'll tell you when it's safe. Okay, so there's my fat leg. I'm not gonna like show you the top of my fat leg because like, hello, it's a legging, y'all. And while I do feel like leggings are pants, cause like, whatever, like you don't need to have that much information. <laughs> Okay, sorry, I'm not messing around to try to get like my whole self in frame because like, I just don't have time for that today. But um, so here's my fat lady legs. So you can see I got fat lady legs. Like, by the way, this is my Freya sweater. It is in um, Brooklyn T. Quarry. Freya by, I believe, Mr. Brooklyn Tweet, Jared Flood. So here they are. These are the, like the circuit boardy ones. And as you can see, I'm not fat, like, fat belly little legs. I'm, like, fat all the way down. So, like, okay. Woo! I'm sitting on a futon. Don't judge me. <laughs> so, I just wanted to give you a heads up because lots of leggings, which you would think would be, like, hello, stretchy pants. But a lot of leggings are not made for actually like fat, fat ladies. Like lots of times they go up to like a size 22 or something like that. These say they go to size 28. They don't give specific measurements, but I, I have big fat lady legs. Like, as you can see, like I actually probably carry like the majority of my weight in my legs. So like I can't reach around my calf like at all. Not even close. I can't wear extra, extra wide calf boots. Okay, so that should, like I'm hoping that'll kind of, like I'm a size 26, 28, but lots of times those pants are too tight in my calves. You gotta carry around with the other 300 pounds of me. Like I got big calf muscles and some extra stuff too. No lies. But anyway, so if you're a fat lady and you've been looking for leggings, I cannot test a test to the long-term life of these. However, my daughters have always held up very nicely and I have worn these three days and they've had a wash and they don't have any pilling in the thigh. Like I'm like literally, <laughs> look at me feel my thighs on camera. There's like no pilling at all. Okay, so that's pretty remarkable. They are 100% synthetic. There's no cotton in them at all. So sweet legs. <laughs> they are currently, I don't know if they, uh, cause I think hers have shipped from America. Um, but the fat, fat lady ones I have ordered, they have come from Canada, but they've still come very quickly. They've come via FedEx. I have had to sign for them. So FYI. And it's not like I bought 17 pairs and they were like a million dollars. Um, I have had to sign for them though. But this shipping is still only $5 US. So I don't know like how that that's going to progress. Because again, these are a relatively new introduction in this size range. So we'll see. They've always had a, they've always had like a regular and a plus, but this is like a plus two. Double plus. Extra plus. Okay, so that's shenanigans in my pocketbook. That's the thing, right? <laughs> okay, then shenanigans of the mind. Again, I'm going to do a book review in an extra episode. Um, but I also wanted to recommend, I just realized this week, I have not recommended this to you before. I'm not sure how I've managed to not do that. But um, I've been especially enjoying, I kind of, kind of, um, I seem to kind of consume this podcast in spurts, like, um, it's the podcast is, I'll just tell you, the podcast is called She's All Fat. So like, she's all that, but she's all fat. 
and it's hosted by two young women who have been friends for a long time. I say young women because they, I don't know that they've identified exactly what their ages are, but they do identify as millennials. Um, so I will be honest with you, parts of this podcast made me feel wicked old. Because A, there's a lot of pop culture stuff that I don't understand. And B, <laughs> like current pop culture. And that, like, not that I live under a rock, but kind of I live under a rock. But then also that, like, they like to talk about, um, you know, when they get on, like, the reminiscent train or whatever, like, when you're thinking about other stuff from your youth and, like, being all, like, identifying about, ooh, 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 like I did about the Bramley Hedge thing the other day. Theirs is not from my youth. <laughs> so they do sometimes, I do sometimes feel, like, rather ancient. Um, when I listen to them, but I will say that they seriously make me laugh and I feel like they have a good show. Um, so it's a body positivity podcast. I think that's specifically what they call it. They call it. Um, but basically they're two fat chicks. They're friends. They talk about being fat. They talk about other stuff and I highly recommend it. I will say I don't, again, this is one of those things that I kind of consume in spurts and like I'll remember and then like w like listen to like four or five of them and then I'll something will happen and I'll be like I can't handle reality. I can only listen to Harry Potter. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm working on it. But so like so then I have to like not listen for a little while. Um, but I'm always happy when I go back to them. I will say that I feel like every great once in a while they'll have an episode where I'm like. So, like, if you just start randomly in a random place and you're like, I don't know about this, just try another episode, like, two away from that. So, like, I recommend, like, just looking at the, the podcast um, episode titles and picking one that sounds interesting to you. But if that one is like, Ugh, then just maybe give it enough, like, go a few from that and try again. Um, and then if you still don't like it, like, that's cool. You don't have to like it. But I do dig them. Yesterday when I was listening, or the day before... Because the great thing about them is that they have, not only do they have informed content, like research content, considered content, but they have this beautiful interaction, um, much like um, Call Your Girlfriend. So the, it's like an informed, well thought out, well edited show, but they also have so much side banter that is so enjoyable. Um, and so it makes sometimes the topics that are like very heavy on your heart easier to, there's the sugar, right? It helps medicine go down. So I find them to be very enjoyable. I am not sponsored by them, but I like them. So, <laughs> so again, that's called She's All Fat. All right, let's talk about knitting. Oh wait, no, let's not talk about knitting yet. Ha, I lied. Um, one more thing I wanted to talk about um, in terms of that kind of stuff. Shenanigan still. Um, I was talking about in my bonus episode about um, being conscious of the media that you're consuming and the images that you're consuming of other human beings and how that might affect how you're feeling about your own body. But I wanted to share some additional resources to diversify your feed. So if you have been like out of the, like if you're not on Instagram, there has been a swift uptake in the awareness by a larger number of people that we have a diversity problem in the knitting community and that um, it's hurting us. So that's all I'll say about that. I'll talk more about that in the bonus episode of the book review. But... If you're looking for other ways to get cool stuff in your feed that you're enjoying and you like seeing different people doing different stuff, mostly knitting, um, <laughs> I'm going to put on my Instagram feed, like on my profile page in the stories that like stay there, um, I'm going to put links to several folks who have compiled um, awesome resources. So they have, t they have like asked for shout outs from um, people, uh, from knitters of color and from diverse knitters that can um, kind of bank profiles so that if you are looking either to have someone to identify with like I need some more people in my feed that look like me or you're like I need some more people in my feed that do not look like me these are great resources for finding that information so I will put that in my 
profile on Instagram, but in case I lose my mind or something, um, Books and Cables has a POC fiber, so personal color fiber section. Hey Brownberry has a black indigenous POC, black indigenous per people of color yarns section, so like actual yarn providers, dyers or producers or fiber producers. Um, Ocean underscore by the sea has both an accessibility and diversity compilation on her, again, these are on like their profile pages. And Lady Dye Yarns, so Lady D-Y-E Yarns, um, has a person of color business section on hers. Um, so you can click on those, those are permanent stories that are saved, they won't disappear or anything like that, unless they choose to take them down for some reason, but it's not like that 48 hour thing. Um, but they sh they'll be there, and you can check those out for other... Oh, and then the Olive Trees and the Moon. So the Olive Trees and the Moon. I think it's plural trees. Again, I'll put the link in my thing. Um, she has... Um, she is compiling currently. She doesn't have it there yet, but hopefully it'll be there soon. She is currently compiling um, one of those thing, one of those uh, lists for podcasts by people of color. So and other diverse sources. So that should be all. Again, that's not up yet, so I don't know exactly what the constraints of that are, but a diversity-minded uh, podcaster roundup. Um, other hashtags I've started following this week? Taking up space outdoors. That one is both like skin color diversity and um, body diversity. So it encompasses both things and it's really awesome. Um, United Outside and Diversity in Nature. So those are all new hashtags that I found this week that I really enjoy. Yeah, okay. Okay, so that's that. A reminder, if you do use any of those resources, like if you're an Instagram person and you have found use for those resources, Please remember that a lot of those women have links in their profile pages where you can buy them a coffee. Or if they're a designer, you can buy a pattern. But remember that you're not supporting them, you're not donating to them, you're actually just paying them for their time. Like it's not, like donating has this connotation of like altruism or like, is like, it's legit just like, these things take a lot of time to do. And if you're enjoying the resource, then buy ladies coffee, if you can obviously, but maybe also be beans and rice one week. Cut out meat for that week. Not for the week. Cut out meat for the day. That's $3 for a coffee right there. I'm just saying. It's an option. I know not everybody can do it, but if you can, please do. Okay. Okay, I gotta get that done. Okay. Let's talk about I'll put up time. I mean, you're already here. Whatever. <laughs> okay, I'll put a time stamp in about where the knitting is. But you're already here. <laughs> hmm. So, this week, I have worked on three things pretty much exclusively. The first thing is my Ricky hat. Um, Ricky is one of my favorite patterns. I have more of this pattern completed than of any other. Like, I have more of these objects completed. Than of any other pattern. It is by Sarah Young and this yarn is by Zomer Dye Lab. Um, this is their Faraday base which is a DK base and this is the hashtag basic colorway because and I don't know if it's going to show up but it's actually like a very it's a very warm orange it's not like an awesome GG orange. I mean it's awesome because it's orange but you know what I mean. So, here's my hat so far. This yarn was gifted to me at the 2817 Rhinebeck, so thank you so much. I not only appreciate this yarn, but I appreciate you. So I'm not right, I'm not right, I'm not quite ready to start crown decreases yet, but I'm pretty close. I think I've got another two inches. My hair is super out of control. My homemade haircut's really starting to show itself. I'm gonna have to like go to super cuts any second now to get this trimmed up. But anyway, I'm super fancy. I told you I was basic. <laughs> so 
there's that. Yay! I am wearing leggings too. See? What can I do? Oh! I totally forgot. I am wearing... I told you I was wearing... I told you I was wearing my um, Freya cardigan. This is a pattern by Jared Flood, and it's knit with Brooklyn Tweed's Quarry, which is a single ply bulky. I hear you. I've ref I completed it fairly recently, so if you're new to the podcast, you can find it. It's one of the last few episodes, but like I agree, that's crazy. But whatever, I like it. <laughs> Past me is rolling her eyes at current me. I feel her. It's okay. But I am wearing my Piper's Journey by Paula Emmons Feasley of the Knitting Pipeline. I've been channeling her for my bird watching energy. Paula, I'm going to need you to send me some more non sparrow birds. Could you just. <laughs> but this is Beaver Slide Dry Goods and their. Um, sport, I want to say. I don't know what the colors are anymore. But if you are looking for a woolen spun, woolen spun dyed in the wool fingering weight yarn, um, or sport weight, this is technically sport weight, but whatever, it's all relative. Don't put me inside your boundaries. Just yarn. Um, it totally works that way. <laughs> and I've had this shawl for this, okay, let me just rephrase that. This shawl has has survived like five years of cullings, so I don't wear it a lot. But when I do, it's very comforting. And really, there's not much that has survived five years of knitting cullings in this house. <laughs> not much. Uh, but the next thing I've been working on is my after party sweater. And that's a pattern that you can find in Lane Magazine. And it's by Astrid Trolland. This is Bartlett Yarn Sport in the terracotta colorway. So here's where I was last week. So I didn't get a ton done, but that's fingering weight for fat lady. So like, oh yeah, it's technically sport weight, but it's basically fingering weight. Again, it's all relative. <laughs> so that's like, a lot fur finger a fat lady sweater, so just back off. It's okay. <laughs> so I'm enjoying that though. It's not like I've put it aside because I'm not enjoying it. I'm just have been really enjoying the next thing I'm working on, which is my Hedge Witch shawl. And this is the Hedge Witch shawl by Nat Red Wolf. Red Wolf. And this is a knit along that's being hosted by uh, the Gentle Knitter and Fiber Trek. And I talked a lot about the yarn selection I used last week. Oh my gosh, I'm in the middle of a roll row. Really? Not that it matters, but <laughs> it's like on tiny deals anyway, but <sighs> nerd. So <laughs> here is mine thus far. Right? Okay, so this is the spine. So this is the top of the spine. There we go. So I've completed my first um, little contrast section and I'm a, I am have to finish this row and then I'll start the final border section, which is also the green. So mine is knit with um, Plotulopi, which is an unspun single ply Icelandic. What is up with me in the single plies lately? What's wrong with me? Um, and the, but I'm holding that with a strand of Webb's Southampton, which is a mohair silk. Um, and I'm totally digging it. Can you see, like, do you see how, like, soft it is? Um, I have just cracked into, like, again, within this last little bit, the third cake of the Plotulopi of this colorway. Um, and I did make mine about 10%. Not only is my gauge giving me a bigger shawl, I can't remember what the percentage was. Maybe it was like 10%, I don't remember. But I also decided to add like a basically 10% more to the body. So I just, ex I just worked extra rows. Um, and this is a super easy shawl to do that with because like it, if you can read your knitting, you don't need to worry about where you're gonna start contrast bands or anything like that. Um, 
So it's a great shawl if you want to modify it. You could make this, sh it's the, the basic shape is the like double wide triangle. So it's not like the traditional hat, which is like half of a square. It's the increase once in the middle. You increase every other row in the middle, increase every row on the edges. So it's that elongated triangle. Um, so you could easily make it whatever size you wanted to without any trouble at all because the texture pattern, as long as you finish a right side and a wrong side, you're fine. Um, yeah, so I'm really digging it. Um, things I didn't talk about last week because I felt like I talked about my yarn selection a lot. <laughs> oh, speaking of yarn selection, somebody asked me about the Plotulopi. Okay, so first question was, would I use the Plotulopi alone in a sweater? Um, the answer is maybe. Um, I, what I would like to do actually, I'm gonna have um, extra of this yarn. So what I would like to do is knit myself a large scale swatch of a single strand at a fairly tight gauge um, and see how that wears. Like I'm concerned about how it'll wear, um, but I wanna experiment with my, for myself because I do put more wear on sweaters because um, I just have more pressure, like because of my size, like I feel like Maybe I'm making this up, but it seems logical. I feel like I have more like pressure at my rubbing points because there's more weight on the thing, right? Like my arm is heavier, my body sticks out further. Therefore, I feel like there is more friction. Um, so I want to test that for myself. I know other people have made items. I just want to test it for myself. Um, so I'm going to do that because I would definitely, like if that has a decent wear pattern, I would totally consider making myself a single ply sweater. Would I hold it double? I wouldn't be against it, but I probably wouldn't. Um, and that's simply because the le the Leti Lopi, like the next, like the, the Aaron weight one, is literally just the Plotu Lopi held double with a slight twist in it, like a very slight twist. So... I would probably just get that. Now, if like I just like magically like walked out my door and there was a bunch of plotulopi in there, would I do? I would I make a sweater out of it? Yes, I would. But if I were gonna purchase it, I probably would purchase the letilopi first. If I was gonna, if I was planning to hold it double, like with itself, um, just because, um, because of the cake. You do, have, like I talked about last week, you do have to be very mindful of how you're removing the yarn. You can't just like throw it in a project bag and like yank off five yards to knit with. Like you have to be, you have to be mindful. You have to put very little pressure on its removal. You have to, for me, I have to put it next to me. I can't just like leave it in a knitting bag, things like that. Um, so the next question was, would I make a sweater with the Plotulopi? And I like, just like, let's just admit, admit that I just like to say Plotulopi. I don't know if I'm saying it right. I don't even care if I'm saying it because, okay, if I'm really saying it wrong, I'll try to fix it. I apologize. But I do like to say it the way I say it. <laughs> and I'll say it by, the, my, by myself that way. Would I hold it with a mohair silk for a sweater? Um, probably not. Simply because, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't rule it out, but it's probably not what I would choose. Um, simply because it does have a ripping out problem. Now it's not terrible, um, but it does want to grab onto itself. And so I would be concerned if it was a sweater that I was all at all unfamiliar with, that that might be problematic. Um, and I don't know, like, I don't know if I was actually wearing, cause like when you're wearing a shawl, you're usually wearing it on at least one layer of clothing, right? And so yes, when you're wearing a sweater over, like I always wear a shirt underneath my sweaters. I'm not like a next to skin sweater person. Um, but it's closer and more like fitted to your body. And so I feel like these, the mohair is more likely to work its way next to my skin. And I don't know if I would like that. Well, 
not against it, but I'm not sure that I would, I'm not sure I would choose. There are so many wonderful yarns that I want to use all the days, um, that I don't know that I would choose it, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So that's that question. So then I wanted to talk about two other things that I'm doing slightly differently than the pattern indicates. And this is not in any way because the pattern is not lovely and wonderful. It's just I'm trying to make it work better for me personally. Um, the pattern is written so that you do this texture on the wrong side of the fabric. Um, so, for example, your right side row is always just knitting straight across with increases, but just knitting. Um, like instead of having a purl back row, you have a knit back row. And the purl side is where you're doing shape, when you're doing the texture. But for me, I don't know if it was um, because my yarn is so much fuzzier, or maybe it's just me too, I don't know. But I had more difficulty than I would have liked reading the wrong side of the fabric. So here's the wrong side of my fabric. And so, like, I am a knitter that relies on reading my knitting. Like, I'm not necessarily a knitter. Not that I don't count when I'm knitting, but I'm very distractible. Hundred and ten percent. Like, 175 percent. Um, and so I do rely on reading my knitting because I frequently, like, will either just get sidetracked or again, we want, you know, I'm watching something or reading, listening to something or whatever. And so I do rely on looking at my knitting to tell where I'm at and what I'm doing. Um, and for me, I could not do that with this, this texture worked on the wrong side. Um, and so it ultimately just was like a little bit more stressful than I wanted it to be. So it took me out of mindfulness. Like, do you know what I mean? Like it took me out of just like being conscious to like, okay, not allowing myself to be broken in my mindfulness. Do you know what I mean? Like, like it's one thing to be mindful and it's another thing to be mindful, but then when you're not mindful, you're punished for it. Do you know what I mean? So like my goal was mindfulness, but I'm going to fail like a lot, a whole lot. <laughs> so, um, I, I decided to work the texture on the right side of the fabric so that my mindfulness could come from moments like winding off the yarn and being present in that or, you know, shaping moments or again, the shape, the texture creation on the right side of the fabric was very mindful. It looks like a, it's this very repetitive thing that you do and it's simple and Okay, so there were plenty of other access points for mindfulness for me that I did not need them to be in the strict and intense focus that mindfulness is, but does not work for me. So I decided to work the texture on the right side and I had a little hiccup with that. Um, this is a texture where as, and I'm giving you what the texture is because like you could look at a stitch pattern and find what this texture is. Um, on the, ro the wrong side, you, Basically, you're purl two, you do a yarn over, you purl two, and then you lift that yarn over over those two stitches. So you're not increasing, like that yarn over is not an increase, you don't have to decrease or anything. You're just pulling it over. And so, as you can see, you get this is a yarn over that's just been pulled over those two stitches. Okay? But part of what gives you that texture is that the purl yarn. When you finish your stitch, the yarn is in the front, right? So when you do a yarn over and then purl the next stitch, the yarn makes a complete wrap of the needle. So unlike when you're knitting with a yarn over and the, the yarn just kind of goes like front, to, like it doesn't make a complete circle around the, the needle. Um, that's what gives it that texture because when I made the transition to trying to work the, um, the texture on the right side and all I did to do that was, um, so you, I just, so you're purling a texture and then the next row is a knit row, right? You're, you're, you knit across. So that's your rest row. 
I broke the yarn on the left side of my completed work and reattached it to the right side so that I was then again still looking at the knit side of the fabric. But I was on, I had, had completed the spacer row so that I could do the texture row again. But when I did that, I just did a regular yarn over, just like a yarn over that you do between two knit stitches. And so when I wrapped that, I'm being awkward, I should have put my little like needle keeper things on here. But so when I did that, the texture that I got was much flatter. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it. So that break was me trying to find it, which is one of the reasons I didn't take it out. Um, for one thing, I wanted to leave it so that you could see the difference in how it looks. But for another reason, it, it didn't look, well again, it took me a minute to find it, even though I know generally where it is in the, in the work. Um, so, <laughs> so much juggling, I'm sorry. Um, so here is my regular texture. And you can see probably right here, this is the row. See how it looks a little bit flat? See right there? See how that stitch, that, that yarn, it just looks like flat. Like it just, it looks like I did like a slip stitch almost, right? With just carrying the yarn in front. Whereas these, the ones around it, you can see that it has like a tilt to it, right? It's like an angle, it's almost nodding it. And it also pinches the stitches in considerably more than it does on this row. And again, that's just the nature of the difference on doing a yarn over between two purl stitches and doing a yarn over between two knit stitches. I'm like, now I'm doubting myself, whatever. <laughs> but so the way I remedied that is instead of doing a regular yarn over, you do like a reverse yarn over so that the yarn does in fact go completely around the needle before you work the stitch. And so that complete, that kind of twists it more essentially. And so you get, not only do you get that little angle on it, you also get a little bit more pinch in there because more stuff is happening. So I hope that's in any way makes sense. So that's how I decided, that's how I worked the, the texture on the front side, of the, on the right side of the knitting. Okay, so the other thing I do different, uh, that I'm doing differently on the shawl is I often don't do directional increases. Directional decreases have visual impact from a distance, right? Like you can see directional decreases from here, from like a conversational distance. But for me, I can only see directional increases from here, from like a knitting distance. And if you're that close to me, I don't think you need to be looking at my directional increases. <laughs> so for me, I feel like directional increases are for me like at a macro level, kind of satisfying sometimes. Um, but like in this case, I did not do them. And I often don't do them. So um, like I said, I'm doing a make one left and make one right. I'll just do, I also don't do make ones very often because they tend to make my knitting tighter. Um, they, they make other people's knitting tighter too. It's not like it's just me. But, so usually I do a backwards loop cast on, just for that one stitch, or I just do, like what do I do? I don't know, I just do it. <laughs> it's like a reverse yarn over, right? Like I just do the yarn over so that it goes completely around the needle. So not like it just goes over the top, but like it wraps around the needle, right? And so then the next row I might have to knit into the back of it or something. I don't remember, because I just do it. You can just do it too. You'll figure it out. If you have a hole, you did it wrong. Just <laughs> do it the other way or wrap it around to finish something. Um, but so that's the increase. Those are the increases I'm doing on this shawl. And again, I do think you can, I, I don't in any way disagree that you, that you can't see it at like, again, at the knitter's level. But for me, I don't find that to be particularly satisfying. Um, I don't see a huge, like I don't see a visually a huge difference between make one and left and make one right for me. So I don't do them. We didn't do them until very recently. I feel like Susan B. Anderson, I feel like Susan B. Anderson said this before I did. I thought it 
as I'm sure many of you did too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I invented it. But then when Susan B. Anderson said it, I felt brave enough to say it too. <laughs> I feel like Susan has said this. <laughs> But like we didn't have make one left and make one right until like Ravelry era, I don't think. Now maybe they were a thing and it just wasn't a popular convention, but like I don't ever remember it before. And that's not to say that innovation isn't good, blah, 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 blah. I'm just saying I don't use them. Um, and so if I, now, if I wrote a pattern, I probably would use them because it is such the tradition that is such the convention of the moment that I feel like I wouldn't want to field a million emails from people being like, why didn't you use directional increases? Why don't you know how to knit? Like, so I probably would put them in a pattern just because I'd be like, but <laughs> I don't really use them. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But I am saying, if you need somebody to say, you don't have to, then you don't have to. Okay? Okay, that's what I'm saying. Oh my gosh, I need this all. That was so much. I have it all. Oh wait, I have to record the other thing. It's all for you. You get to be done now. <laughs> so, um, shameless self-promotion. I will have a shop update, a pre-order. Um, running February 1st until it sells out or usually I let it stay up for about a week um, and this will be for Aaron's sweater and I'm not sure if it'll have sweater or just large wedge but it'll definitely be big bags and it'll be definitely large wedge bags there's this like issue with the pattern scale of like me trying to figure out if I'm also going to do an in-between size but anyway so that'll be happening February 1st um, the fabric is a fabric that I had at Rhinebeck this year, and I will show you a preview of it next week, but it does have cats. It does have teacup. I'm not a cat person, but I still like it. It has cats. It has teacups. It has candles. It has yarn. It has apples. And it has a gold background. February 1st. Um, I will probably have a regular update that next Friday. I was concerned. I didn't know if I'd be able to do it the Friday before or the Friday after. It'll probably be that Friday after as I'm waiting for that fabric to come in house for me to sew. Uh, but again, that February 1st will be a true pre-order, which is four to six weeks so that I can get fabric in house and cut those. And I really appreciate folks who are willing to wait that long for a bag. Um, it really helps me as a small business owner not to have to invest too much capital um, and but then also be able to get you what you would like so I appreciate that I know that that's a non-traditional business thing uh, that you don't like go to Target and get a pre-order so I'm glad that you're willing to trust me to do a pre-order I'll tech, talk to you next time in a few minutes but a few minutes more for you Bye.